There are some texts in the Bible that I deliberately avoid. Because there is so much within the text that could be said and should be said that before you ever begin to expound it, you know that you are courting failure. There are so many times when I am through with a message that I have that sense of just failure. God, there's so much there that should have been said and I didn't say it. There's so much more to it and I didn't bring it up. Such is the text that we have chosen for this morning, the most familiar text in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In beautiful, simple words, Jesus has there expressed for us the gospel. The gospel which is the hope to all mankind. As we read this text, we realize that Jesus is actually answering the question of Nicodemus, who had asked him, how can a man be born again? And again, he said, how can these things be? Jesus had been talking to Nicodemus about the necessity of the new birth. He said, Nicodemus, you were born once of the flesh. And that which is of the flesh is flesh. A man born of the flesh is dominated by his flesh and by his fleshly desires. These rule over his life. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Notice the divine imperative, must. Not that a man ought to be born again, or it's wonderful to be born again, or you should be born again. Jesus said, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. There's no other way to come into the kingdom of God except by the new birth. For that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, the world today declares by its actions that the fleshly or material life is superior to the spiritual life. Yet the Word of God and Jesus Christ was constantly affirming that the spiritual life is superior to the life of the flesh. But there are many people who are living under this illusion that to really find real happiness, that a person must pursue his fantasies, his ambitions, his dreams. And men are trying to constantly achieve and attain that dream, that goal, that ambition. But so many men, when they come to their midlife, many of them have accomplished those goals that they set out to achieve. They've gained success in their chosen fields. They are at the height of their career. 
things have gone according to plan. But they look around and they find out that they are empty. The success did not bring to them that sense of fulfillment that they were looking for. And here they are now in what is commonly called midlife crisis. And so often during this period, a man will leave his chosen career and profession and will look for something else. Success in this field didn't bring to me the happiness and satisfaction I thought it would. I better try something else. And they'll quit their jobs, they'll quit their positions to search in some other direction. Because after all, I'm at midlife, and if I haven't found it now in this, I've given the best part of my life to it, I better search someplace else. Or having raised the family and seeing the children now growing up and having the love of a wife and the family Somehow their minds get twisted and they think, oh, I'm missing out on life. And they entertain some new romantic interest because they find that all of these things, as marvelous as they are, have not brought to them that satisfaction, that fulfillment that they were longing for. And they're frustrated. Midlife crisis. I must have taken the wrong path. I've come now to this place and, and I'd like to start over again. This path has not brought me fulfillment. It's not brought me complete satisfaction. If I could just start over again, start in a new career, start in a new area. Jesus said, the life of the flesh will not satisfy. You drink of that water, you're going to thirst again. It is only the life of the Spirit that can bring full and complete happiness and satisfaction to a man. You've got to be born again. The life of the flesh will never satisfy. You need the life of the Spirit. You need to come into a full relationship with God in the Spirit. You must be born again if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus said, Well, Lord, how can I be born again? I'm an old man. I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. Jesus said, No, no. I'm not talking about that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You need a spiritual birth, Nicodemus. You need to be born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, but how can that be? And so Jesus is actually answering this question of Nicodemus. How can I be born again? How can these things be? When first of all, Jesus said, For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus brought to his mind an incident out of the history of his nation. When Moses had brought the children of Israel to the border of the promised land, and they by faith failed to enter in, but turned and sought for a leader to take them back to Egypt, Moses began then to lead them from the direct route up through Beersheba and Ered into the land, the long circuitous route over across the Jordan Rift, into the area of Edom and up through Moab and coming into the land through another direction. And the people began to murmur against Moses and against the Lord. They said, why did they bring us out into this wilderness to die? We would have been better off to stay in Egypt. 
brought us out to this barren place where there's no water and there's no bread and we're sick of this manna. And they were complaining against Moses and the Lord. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And God sent these deadly, fiery serpents into the camp that began to bite the people. And as they were bitten, the people began to die. And they came to Moses and said, Moses, we have sinned against you and against the Lord in our complaining. Pray unto God for us that we might be healed from these snake bites. And so the Lord prayed, or Moses prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Take and make a brass serpent and put it on a pole and set the pole up in the middle of the camp. And it shall come to pass when a person is bitten by one of these deadly serpents, if they will just look at the brass serpent on the pole, they will be healed and not die. And so Moses made a brass serpent, put it on the pole, and set it up in the middle of the camp. And he said to the people, if you're bitten by the snakes and you're dying, just look at this snake on the pole and you will not die. You will be healed. Brass scripturally, is always a symbol of judgment, where the serpent is always a symbol of sin. So the brass serpent on the pole was the symbol of the fact that God had judged their sin. And by looking at that, God brought them healing so that they did not die, realizing that their sin had been judged. Jesus bore our sin and the judgment for our sin upon the cross. And even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man had to be lifted up. And as we look at Jesus upon the cross, we realize that there God judged our sin. And if we look in faith, we will be healed. We will not die as the result of our sin. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him. Now the question, how can a man be born again? How can these things be? How can I start over? How can I have a spiritual life? How can I have fellowship with God? The answer is, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him and again there you have it believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God so loved the world that statement is more remarkable when we consider the world that God loved. It wasn't the world that he originally created. The world that was filled with purity, his glory, his beauty. But the world that God loved was a world that had been marred and cursed by sin. Man who had been marred and cursed by sin. Man who had fallen from that original state in which God had first created him. A world that was now in rebellion against God, that hated God and did not want to obey the laws of God. 
A world that as the result of its rebellion and disobedience was experiencing the blight of sin and its curse. And so it was a world that was filled with greed, hatred, envy, strivings, wars, sickness, suffering. A sad, sick world is the world that God still loved. Love must be measured by the obstacles that it, over, that it overcomes. And when I consider the obstacles that God overcame to love me, I realize how great is God's love. God loved me not because I was loving, not because I was sweet, and generous and beautiful and kind and, and all of these marvelous features. God loved me in spite of my failings and failures and miseries and greed and selfishness. God's love overcame those obstacles and he loved me anyhow, not because. He loved me in spite of. And love is measured by the obstacles that it overcomes. God so loved the world. In that word so, the degree of God's love, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Love must be measured by its gifts. Now, if God wanted to give you something to show you that he loved you, what could God give you that would be a meaningful demonstration of his love? Now, if we want to show our wives that we love them, we may give them a diamond. But that would mean something because it is costly and it took sacrifice and it, and it took something to give that diamond. You know, I had to really budget out and, and scrimp and save and, and all. And it, that really cost me a lot of time on the golf course or other things I could have done with the money. But because I love, I want to show that love in the gift. But the gift has to be measured by what it costs, the sacrifice that it took to gain it. Therefore, for God to give you a diamond or diamonds would be totally meaningless because God can create as many diamonds as he wants. Nothing to, with God. I mean, with us, it's a precious stone, but not so with God. Uh, I, I am convinced that God has entire galaxies out there uh, of solid diamonds, glittering diamonds. And, and when you get to heaven and the angel takes you on the universal tour, As they slow down for one of these galaxies, you'll say, and off to your right is the diamond galaxy. Behold those giant stars. Why, there's one as large as Betelgeuse, 415 million miles in diameter, and it is a solid, flawless diamond. You see, God can create diamonds all over the universe. And to give you a diamond to show that he loves you would be meaningless. And the same would be true with gold. For again, God's creative capacity, he can create and has created all the gold that does exist in the universe. And I'm certain that when we get to heaven, one of the interesting things will be the lavish use of gold for common stuff like street paving just to help us to get a balance 
and to realize that these things that glittered so much on earth and we worked and toiled so hard for on earth and we place such great value upon here on earth are totally worthless in heaven and meaningless. Here I gave my whole life to amass gold and I come and I lay it at my master's feet and I say, here, Lord, I've given my life to gain this gold. I lusted for gold and I sought it. Among the muck and the mire I pressed on. Here it is, Lord. And he says, toss it out in the street. You know, it becomes paving stones. Oh, how our value systems can be twisted. God could not give precious metals or precious gems to demonstrate his love for you. Because he can create all of that that he desires. What is it that God cannot create? There was only one exclusive thing in the universe as far as God was concerned. His only begotten Son. And because God loved you so much, In order to show you that love, he gave his only begotten son. For God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more then shall he not freely give us all things? Oh, if you could only understand today the depth of God's love for you. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But in giving his son, I could understand if God would give his son to sit upon the throne and to have the whole world recognize him, exalt him, extol him, worship him, bowing before him, and to see the glory vested in his son with the world bowing before him. I could understand that. To see a glittering crown of gold upon his head with shimmering diamonds and rubies shining forth in splendor and glory. I could understand that. But God gave his only begotten son to be mocked, to be despised, to be hung upon a cross. And rather than a golden crown studded with diamonds, it was a crown of thorns pressed in his brow. As men mocked him, spat upon him. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his son to hang on a cross. As Jesus said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must, again that word, so must the Son of God be lifted up. There's no other way by which man can be saved. He must be lifted up. Here at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was referring to his cross. There's been a pattern set as the serpent of brass was hanging on a pole showing that God had judged sin. So must the Son of God be lifted up and hang on that cross in order that we might look and live realizing that God has judged 
our sins through him. How can a man be born again? God so loved that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. That glorious word, whosoever, removes all of the distinctions and walls that we may have built up to separate ourselves. Whosoever is all-inclusive. Suddenly, all national barriers are down. Suddenly, all social stratas are removed. Suddenly, the door is open to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every person, whosoever, regardless, whosoever believeth in him. And whosoever will. It is an all-inclusive word. Love must be measured by the broadness that it encompasses. We so often put the restrictions on our love. I love you because you're beautiful. But that eliminates the person next to you that isn't beautiful, you see. I love you because you're sweet, but that eliminates those who aren't so sweet. I love you because you love me, but that immediately eliminates all of those who don't love me. Our love is given out in restricted measures. I put narrow limits on my love. If you agree with me, if you flatter me, if you are giving me perks, then I love you but I'm more prone to exclude people from my area of love than I am to include. <clears throat> because unfortunately, there are more ugly people than beautiful. But God did not place any limits on his love at all. all-encompassing, whosoever believeth in him. You see, God has placed himself within reach of you today. Again, he didn't say for all of the good and sweet and righteous people. Your sin need no longer be a barrier to hold you from God. Whosoever will may drink of the water of life freely. God has not excluded any of you. And he's made it so easy. Whosoever believeth, you say, well, Chuck, that's so simple. You bet it is. You see, that's so simple, even a child can be born again. You're right. In fact, unless you become as a little child, you're going to have difficulty. If you try to make it complex, if you try to weave a great theology around it, you're only going to hide the truth, which is so simple and so straight. God loves you, and God wants you to be a part of his eternal kingdom. God wants you to know the fullness of the blessings that come through fellowshipping with him. And if you will just simply look at the cross of Jesus Christ and believe in God's love, 
manifested there in the sending of his son to take the judgment of your sin. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel. The truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. So we pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity of beginning over a new life of the Spirit. A life that is rich, fulfilling. Thank you, Father, for your love for us that overcame so many obstacles. A love that demonstrated itself in such a marvelous gift. A love that was so all-encompassing. Thank you, Lord, that you so loved us. Help us, Lord to respond to that love today in Jesus' name. Amen. You can accept God's love or you can reject God's love. You see, one thing love cannot and will not do is force itself upon a person. God loves you. That is a fact you cannot escape. But you don't have to accept God's love. You don't have to reciprocate. You don't have to return it. You can say, well, that's great. That's nice. I like that. But I could care less. And you can go on in your pursuit, living a life after the flesh, hoping that someday you might find what you're looking for. But as long as you're following after the flesh, you'll never come to the kingdom of God. You must be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born of the Spirit. You've got to come to that spiritual dimension of life that comes by believing in Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth in him there you come into the dimension of life that never ends. Eternal life, everlasting life to those who believe. Today, God's love comes flowing forth towards you. You can build up walls and barriers and you can harden your heart against it or you can open your heart and receive it. I pray that you will open your heart to receive God's love today. No big deal. Such a simple thing. Such a simple thing. It's just saying, God, thank you for loving me. I accept it. I love you. Maybe you'd like to go back to the prayer room and just get down before the Lord and have a little talk with him before you go home. It won't do you any harm, and it can do you a world of good. The prayer room is the door that goes behind the block wall over here in the corner of the building. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you. And may the love of God just fill your heart to overflowing as you go forth in that love to experience that dynamic new life in Jesus, the life after the Spirit, a life that is so rich and so fulfilling. May you just glory in it all week long.